James was 14 years old when he was abducted by soldiers, bound, beaten, and dragged from his home. He was given a choice, join the army or die. For the next eight months, the young farmer, who never held a gun before, was forced to fight in South Sudan's civil war. He watched children younger than him die on the battlefield. One day, James was shot in the leg and left for dead. His mother had heard he'd been killed, and so she gave him a funeral. But there was no body to bury, so she traced her fingers over the dirt and recited prayers. I met James living in a camp protected by the United Nations. James is supposed to be over there. In South Sudan's capital, Juba. Only days earlier, he'd spoken to his mother for the first time in three years. On the phone, he told her, he was, in fact, alive. During our many conversations over several months, James kept saying how badly he wanted to go home. All he wanted was to return to his family. There are 19,000 child soldiers in South Sudan, 19,000 boys and girls like James. And when viewed through the numbers, it's hard to feel any connection to the gravity of the country's brutal civil war. It's easy to tune out. We tend to focus on the numbers rather than what the numbers represent, which are individual human lives. Stories like James puts a face on an overwhelming crisis, and not just the crisis of South Sudan's child soldiers, but the larger crisis that has devastated a country and been largely forgotten by the world. As journalists, we face a constant challenge. How do we get people to care? How do we get people to read, watch, and engage with situations deemed too far away, too complex, or too hard to understand. With so many problems in the world, we can forget that they impact real people living real lives. And as the wars drag on, we lose hope and interest. I am here today to show you the faces behind those numbers. I'm here to acknowledge that it's hard to care about people and places that we can't relate to. And when something seems too complicated or too terrible, or too massive, we shut down. I struggle too, it's human to shut off. After almost 15 years as a journalist, I've emotionally shut off many times. But I'm here to argue that it's more human to stay open. This is something I've been reminded of during almost three years of living in and reporting from South Sudan. When I decided to go there, a friend said to me, Will anyone care? Is anyone interested? At the time, in early 2017, South Sudan was four years into a civil war. What started as a power struggle between the president and his then vice president quickly escalated along ethnic lines. War spread across the country. It's killed almost 400,000 people and displaced millions from their homes, creating the largest refugee crisis in Africa. Armies on both sides have been accused of creating grave human rights atrocities, including using rape as a weapon of war and forcing children to be soldiers. This is catching up with me right now. <laughs> Weeks after I was there, a famine was declared. 100,000 people were starving. It was the first famine anywhere in the world in six years. The international community called it a man-made crisis caused by the conflict. Food was used as a weapon of war. Aid was often cut off from reaching communities. Soldiers would steal people's crops, leaving families with nothing to eat. The fighting also prevented people from accessing their farms. Women across the country would tell me the daily choice they had to make. If our husbands go to the farm, they'll get killed. If we go, we'll get raped. 
Still, it was usually the women who went. The war, the sexual assault, the famine were covered briefly by international media outlets. But attention was waning. In 2017, the international aid group, the Norwegian Refugee Council, ranked South Sudan as the second most forgotten displacement dis crisis in the world, behind the Democratic Republic of Congo. So why are crises ignored? The international aid group CARE conducted a study, and the majority of people from 12 different countries came back with the answer. There are too many humanitarian crises to keep up with. The majority of respondents felt that they heard the same stories and coverage focused on the same countries all the time. African countries are particularly marginalized. Academic Virgil Hawkins found that CNN's coverage of underreported conflicts decreased between 2000 and 2009. His study focused on news outlets, primarily American, and showed a strong importance in having a US connection. For example, the Congo, a country that's been in conflict for decades, got seven minutes of news coverage in 2009 across the evening news broadcasts of some major American TV networks. Of the 10 minutes of coverage that made up the seven minutes, half focused on Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's visit to the country, three talked about the plight of animals, one focused on children being accused of witchcraft, and one talked about the ongoing conflict, which according to Human Rights Watch escalated that very same year, killing 2,500 people, 7,000 women and girls raped, and a million people forced from their homes. It's our job as journalists to tell these stories. It's our job to draw people in. It's our job to forge a connection. So how do we do this? by seeking out people's individual stories. Social scientist Paul Slovak studies that the human mind is not very good at thinking about or empathizing with millions or billions of people. He calls it the singularity effect. In fact, the higher number of victims in a tragedy increases our feelings of empathy, but our willingness to help decreases. This happens even when it goes from one to two. Most of us will remember the lifeless body of Alan Kurdi, the three-year-old Syrian boy who washed ashore in Turkey in 2015. Or this year, when two migrants from El Salvador, Oscar Alberto Martinez Ramirez and his 23-month-year-old daughter Valeria, died while trying to come to the United States. These images shocked us and caused outrage. But why? because we were able to empathize. We're numb to huge numbers of people. We're receptive to individual stories. Stories like James that put a face on the numbers. Months after I met James, he was reunited with his family in a different UN camp in another part of the country. This was just one person of the millions displaced and one family of the thousands with missing relatives. But it spoke to something everyone in the world can relate to. Family, home, loss. Something I've reported on repeatedly are people separated from their families wanting nothing more than to be reunited with them. For example, child abductions are rampant. They've been going on for decades. Children are commodified, kidnapped, sold in exchange for cows, or forced into marriage. One local activist group has likened it to a form of child slavery. But it's rarely talked about. I met Patrick months after he returned home, after he was abducted by unknown armed men at the age of six, sold for 50 cows, and forced to work in a cattle camp for 10 years. During every step of his journey, when he was slung over the shoulders of his kidnappers and dragged through the forest for days, when he wasn't allowed to go to school like the other children and was forced to tend to the cows all day, he kept repeating the same thing to himself. If I don't die, I'm going to find my way back home. And 10 years later, he did. 
He told his captors he wanted to sell cows at a market in Juba near his family's house. When he showed up at his parents' home, they didn't recognize him. Of course, few of us can relate to what Patrick went through, but his tragedy turned into a story of faith and resilience. I use it as a reminder that people often survive the unimaginable and that anything is possible. And people want their stories told. Nobody wants to be forgotten. A handwritten letter from 1992 smuggled out of southern Sudan near the city of Juba during the Second Civil War depicts the pain of what it's like to be caught up in a forgotten conflict. The letter read, lucky are the people of Somalia and Yugoslavia, for the world's eyes rest on them. Condemned are the people of Juba, for the world has been denied access to the town and does not even seem to care anyway. It may be a blessing to die in front of a camera. Then, at least the world gets to know about it. But it is painful to die or be killed without anybody knowing it. As the writer points out, people will only know or care if these stories are told. It's our job as journalists to tell these stories and to help people care. But we face challenges. Wars can be neglected because governments prevent them from being covered. Two weeks ago, I was kicked out of South Sudan. My press pass was revoked for six months because of an article I wrote. I was told that I had instilled panic and fear. The article was about rising tensions in the capital ahead of the formation of a unity government which was supposed to take place last week and has since been extended to February. After years of reporting in the country, I was given 24 hours to leave. In 2017, 20 foreign correspondents were either kicked out or banned entry from South Sudan. One seasoned journalist, Simona Fulton, was accused of only talking about sexual violence and the conflict and not reporting anything positive. Stories in local media not approved by national security can be removed before going to press, leaving blank spaces on the front of newspapers. Local journalists are often the most affected. South Sud Sudanese journalists self-censor. They can be detained, harassed, or threatened for writing stories that the government doesn't like. One local journalist told me it's more dangerous to carry a camera than a gun. The latest numbers from the advocacy group Reporters Without Borders show that incitement against journalists does in fact lead to violence. And the number of countries deemed safe where journalists can operate in complete security is decreasing while authoritarian regimes tighten their grip on the media. Many of these governments are emboldened in their crackdowns by the vilification of media in the West with terms like fake news which gives them an excuse to further restrict press freedom. When we take our attention off of a crisis, there's less accountability, the atrocities grow. I traveled to Burundi this year, an East African country with very little press freedom and grave human rights abuses. As an example, there's a government-run youth militia charged with killing or silencing anyone suspected of supporting the opposition. One man who told me he was a member of this youth militia said he's ordered more murders than he can count. A local journalist said the problem as he saw it was that there was no international media reporting the story. So the government could do whatever it wanted. So what is our duty? What can we do? As news consumers, we can choose to be less passive and take ownership for what we read and watch, knowing that people's stories connect us to a context. We can seek out ones that feature a human face. Those stories are out there. Find them. We can support media organizations that invest in on-the-ground reporting, sending journalists into a context to understand what's going on, rather than rely on remote reporting. We can support organizations that invest in local journalists who understand the nuances. As journalists, it's our responsibility to be fair and accurate 
and not to be one-sided or superficial. It's on us not to oversimplify complex contexts into sound bites or easy to understand black and white concepts. Those lack nuance. But why should we bother? Why should we put in the effort when we have so much going on in our own lives, our own countries, our own communities? As society, the more immediately we pay attention, the better able we are to hold power to account. And this isn't just about local authorities. We can expose the role of the international community, your own governments and aid organizations that are tax money funds. For example, the war in Yemen isn't taking place in a vacuum. Middle East politics and US weapon sales have enabled an unspeakable crisis. On an individual level, it's important to care because the more we shut off and become numb to the suffering around us, the more we cheat ourselves of a fuller human experience. As author and Buddhist nun Pema Chodron said in her book, Welcoming the Unwelcome, by allowing ourselves to connect to the real suffering in the world, we link to humanity, we strengthen our resilience, and we stay connected even when we want to withdraw. By opening ourselves up to the stories of our fellow human beings, we become more aware of ourselves and the world around us. We might even be reminded that life is precious and to live accordingly. I was reminded of this almost two years ago. While covering a protest in Juba, I was punched, hit on the head, and strangled with my purse strap by a mob of demonstrators angry about an arms embargo imposed by the United States. They thought I was American. What started as a peaceful protest turned violent when a mob of men descended upon me, I dropped to the ground. One man saved my life. He threw his body on top of mine and whispered in my ear, don't worry, it'll be okay. I'd never met him before and I never saw his face that day as he helped me to safety. After the incident was over while I was processing everything, all I wanted to do was find that man. I needed to find him. I needed to look this total stranger who saved my life in the eyes and say thank you. A few days later, I did. His name was Chief Juma, and I learned that he was one of the protest organizers. Come on, Chief Juma. <laughs> so I asked him, why did, you save, why did you risk your life to save mine? And he said, we wanted peace. We didn't want anyone to die. Something awoke in me that day. I hadn't realized just how much I had shut down. As journalists, we sometimes turn off the vulnerable human parts of ourselves in order to do our job, in order not to break down over some of the terrible things we witness. That day helped me reconnect to Chief Juma, to the people of South Sudan, to myself. And it reminded me something that's so important to remember that beyond the complex politics and the shocking statistics, South Sudan is a country of people, like any other, like Chief Juma, who want to live their lives, be with their families, and live in peace. And I came here today to share with you their very human stories. Thank you.